our hearts to love and revere you, that we may diligently live according to your commandments. We In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. In Jeremiah we read, This is the covenant I will make with them, says the Lord God. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord.
compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God, though we have rebelled and wandered far off. Let us then ask for mercy, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Merciful God, come make God our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word, Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our Redeemer, in our weakness we have failed to be your messengers of forgiveness and hope. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, that we may follow your commands and proclaim your reign of love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the Day, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. For the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. So also Christ did not glorify himself with becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he had suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. About this we have much to say that is hard to explain, since you have become dull in understanding. But though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is unskilled in the word of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose faculties have been trained by practice to distinguish good from evil. For the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servants be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honour. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Save me from this hour. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Today is the fifth Sunday in Lent. 
when we meet together next week, it will be Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, a week which is full of drama and emotion, of deep solemnity and sadness, a week which will culminate in the great three days from the evening of Maundy Thursday to the extraordinary joy and celebrations of Easter morning. I first experienced Easter at St. James as a parishioner in 2009. This morning I want to share with you a profound experience I had that Easter which changed my life and which has stayed with me in vivid detail ever since. I grew up in an Anglican church in Tasmania and we were very committed to our local church. My family were all involved in various ways. It was there that I first learned to be a server and on occasion would turn pages for our parish organist. Along with my parents, we were involved in Bible study groups, in working bees, and we all took our turn assisting with all the various ministries of a country parish. I also went to a Christian school where we read and studied the Bible together. We prayed every day. And we were encouraged to make the link between our faith and how we lived our lives, not separating one from the other, or just saving up our Christianity for Sunday mornings when we put on our Sunday best. I tell you that by way of background, because by the time I came to St. James and to Sydney, I was in my early 20s. I had plenty of experience of Easter, or so I thought. I had attended Easter every year since my birth. I had been involved in those services. I had sung the hymns. I had read the readings. I had listened to the sermons. Well, most of them. And at school, we had studied the Easter narrative, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. But my first Easter at St. James was different. I had never before been to a church where there was a service every day of Holy Week, including the weekdays. We'd waved our palm branches around on many a Palm Sunday before, but then not come back to church until Maundy Thursday, perhaps, or more probably, Good Friday. That first Easter at St. James, I came for Palm Sunday and was intrigued to read about the midweek services. And I was impressed by the Holy Week preacher, and I thought I'd make the effort to come during the week after work. And so I came along on Holy Monday for the 6.30 Eucharist. And I came back on Tuesday, and again on Wednesday. And on Maundy Thursday, I was struck by it all, the foot washing, the dignity and complexity of the beautiful liturgy, the hymns, the sublime choral singing. And then it came time for the service to end. The ministers set off in a solemn procession to the side chapel, which had been adorned, as it always is, with foliage to represent the Garden of Gethsemane. And the whole chapel was filled with candles. In true St. James style, the procession was solemn and meaningful. It was prayerful. The sacrament was processed to the garden and the sacred ministers knelt in solemn reverence and prayer. And then the celebrant stood up, moved to the entrance of the chapel and declared, and they all forsook him and fled. And the lights went out and the servers, usually so disciplined and carefully choreographed, scattered in all directions and after a short hiatus began to appear in the now darkened sanctuary in a deliberate fashion in order to strip the altar and the chancel of its furnishings. 
choir began to chant the psalm, and I felt distinctly uncomfortable. I swallowed hard as the candles were not only extinguished but were removed altogether. Even the presence lamp, a reminder of God's presence with us, was extinguished. I particularly remember the jarring movement of the servers, not in their usual straight lines and moving in pairs, two by two, but almost like soldiers coming in to gather up all the precious things, to take them and hide them away. They took to their duties without delay, and soon enough, this church was bare. It was also dark, and a few folk had now moved to the chapel and were sitting now by candlelight or perhaps kneeling in prayer. And I, somewhat dazed from all this uncomfortable drama, left the church via the west door. The sides person on duty whispered to me as I left, will you be coming back later to keep the watch? and gestured to the large sign which read, Maundy Thursday Vigil, and Jesus' words to his disciples, Will you not keep awake with me one hour? How could I refuse? I put my name down for 11 p.m., and I went home. When I returned, all was silent, almost, it's incredible timing, isn't it? <laughs> I came in from the north door, and there in the chapel were four or five folk in silent prayer, and so I went in and took my place alongside them. It was beautiful to sit there with them, to sit with the others who had gathered to spend that time in silent reflection. And the clock struck 11, and then one by one they all left, until it was only me. And I suddenly felt a tremendous sense of responsibility. All these folk before me seemed to know what to do, and it was fine to just sit there with them, because it was all going to be okay. But now it was my turn to keep the watch, and I'd never done it before. What if I got it wrong? How are you meant to keep the watch anyway? The sides person hadn't said anything about that. They just suggested that I should add my name to the list and turn up. I squirmed a bit, and I wondered for a moment what I'd got myself into. It was pretty awkward for a while. I'd signed on for an hour, and I was starting to wonder how I was going to pass all that time. I gathered my thoughts, and I tried to concentrate. What's really going on here? The garden represents Gethsemane, and here on the altar of repose is the sacrament, the body and blood of Christ. And Jesus asks his followers to keep watch and to stay awake. And I wondered about the finer details of the story. What actually does the Bible have to say to us about that night in the garden? So I began to read the scriptures, Matthew first, of course, beginning with the Last Supper and then off to the Mount of Olives and into the garden, and the account of what is sometimes referred to as the agony in the garden. Then I read Mark's account, and then Luke, and although the episode in the garden is much shorter and the name Gethsemane isn't used, I also read John's account up to the arrest of Jesus. And I was struck by the details, the similarities and the differences, the nuance of the text, the heaviness of the scene. Above all, I was struck by the humanity of Jesus, that he would wrestle with God the Father with tears and anguish. Matthew and Mark say that he became grieved and agitated and that he threw himself on the ground and cried out to God. 
I had tears in my eyes at this story, one I had heard so many times before. Suddenly now it became so present and so very human in this candlelit scene amongst the foliage. It became immensely personal as I sat there with my Lord, recalling his anguish and his agony the pain of what he knew was coming. And he cried out, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Christ Jesus in his humanity was deeply grieved, wrestling with God's call to him to undergo great suffering and death the very death he had predicted again and again to his disciples, though they refused to believe it. Gethsemane means oil press. The garden, which pilgrims still visit today, perhaps you have been there, has many olive trees. And in order to extract the precious olive oil, the olives are pressed they undergo immense pressure to extract the treasured oil. And so it is for Jesus, undergoing great pressure now as his suffering begins, suffering which will continue through the arrest, the trial, the public flogging, and the eventual crucifixion. And on the cross... His blood will flow from his hands and from his side. Precious blood. The blood of our salvation. And I wept. I wept for my own sin, now forgiven. That despite my frailty and my failure, here reminded that by the precious blood of Christ, by his death and resurrection, I was made whole again. My mind took me to that great hymn which begins, My song is love unknown, my Saviour's love to me. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? And I thought of the people who'd been in the chapel before me and those who'd been in church earlier that night. And I began to understand why all these folk had made the effort to come and spend this time in worship, in prayer, and in reflection. Jesus turns to his disciples in the garden and says to them, Stay awake and pray that you do not come into the time of trial. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again and again he takes himself away at a short distance, prays, and then returns and finds them sleeping. I find myself now realizing that this is not just a story for the night of Maundy Thursday, but for every single day of Christian living. Weak flesh, occasionally willing spirit, mostly lazy, usually apathetic at best to God's great love. But now in sharp focus, I am confronted by my own apathy, shaken from my complacency. Stay awake. Pray. I had signed on from the hour from 11 p.m. to midnight, and when I began, I had wondered how I might pass the time. Now I didn't want it to end. The hymn continues, Here might I stay and sing no story so divine 
Never was love, dear king. Never was grief like thine. This is my friend in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. No one came at twelve, so I stayed, not daring to leave until the next disciple came to keep the watch unbroken. Someone came a little after one, and I went home, silent, humbled, changed. Good Friday was tough that year. The lump in my throat was so big I swallowed the hymns. The agony of hearing the story of the crucifixion of my Lord with whom I had spent this precious time the night before suddenly felt so much closer than it ever had before. This wasn't someone else's story or someone else's Lord anymore. And the church was bare and barren. No organ playing. No vestments. No candles. And it felt as if the whole world had been turned upside down. And then we came and gathered again at first light on Easter day. And the exultet was sung. And the bells rang out. The Gloria was sung, and the relief and the joy was unspeakably beautiful. And then I came forward to the altar rail, and I received the sacrament, and it felt so personal, as if Christ was saying to me, I meant this for you. Nothing has ever been the same for me since that Easter. I had always, in the past, struggled to feel as though any of this was my story. It seemed like someone else's journey, just a little out of reach, a little distant. All those other people in church seemed so much more worthy than me of God's great love. There's even the description of the beloved disciple who enjoyed a particular closeness to Jesus, receiving special insight and clarity. Oh, to be like him. Someone gave me a book a little while ago by a monk, Brother Jim Woodrum in Massachusetts. In it he writes, Will you stay a little longer? accepting the invitation to have your feet washed, following him to the cross, and waiting in the wee hours of the morning for the sun to rise. If you have courage to stay with Jesus, you may find as the Easter sun shines through these stained glass windows, that the identity of the beloved disciple all this time has been you. in one God.
Lord, as we enter this sixth week of Holy Lent, guide us on the path that leads to you. We pray that our one choice is to choose the deepening of your life in us. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for the church, that its worship and prayers in this holy season reflect the mystery and grace of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the peoples of our world, those who live in peace and those who live in violence. In this Easter season, coming to Holy Week, we are mindful of violence in the world as a response to people's rage and fear and avarice. In Australia, we pray in particular for the women and men and children who suffer violence within their family households. And we pray for people who suffer in our country pri uh, pri public violence in the case of the Aboriginal people since the beginning of the British colony and at the moment for people in our communities such as the Jewish people who fear violence for the very first time. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray to have the spirit of Jesus to observe suffering in our families and friends and in strangers. We pray that we can offer the compassionate presence of Jesus in our words and actions. 
without the imposition of our own prejudices, judgments and advice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the communities that nourish us, including our community of St. James. We pray in particular for our dearly loved priests, Christopher and John, and our dearly loved musicians, Warren and Marco, as they prepare for Holy Week with our congregation and with all people who worship with us. And we pray for all the angels in St. James who every year so joyfully prepare for Easter. Nourish them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our hear prayer. Our we pray for people known to us and not known to us who are ill. In our own parish, we pray for Father Cox, Lisa Stapleton, Alan Melrose, John Watton, Peter Harper, Quentin Miller, Jean Matthews, Colin Middleton, Father Lance Johnson, David Balderston, Walter Sutcliffe, David Cheatham, Chris Cheatham, Cheryl, Elizabeth Bloomfield, Claire Corbalt, Alison Sharp, Robert Bevan, Raphael Clark, and Anne Ryan. And Lord, we pray for the peaceful release of all people, known and unknown to us, who are dying. On death, may they rest in your blessed eternal presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we ask in faith, we may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
wise and gracious God, you spread the table before us. Nourish your people with the word of life and the bread of heaven. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honor be yours always and everywhere, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to walk in the way of his love. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and sing
merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. And looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us in the body of your Son. And bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in the songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honor and glory and power are yours forever. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray, Our Father in heaven. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not ready to receive you, but only you say the word. And I shall be.
let us pray. God of mercy, may we who have shared in this holy meal know your forgiveness in our lives, bring your reconciliation to others, and be a sign of your wholeness in this broken world. Most loving God, you send us into the world you love. Give us grace to go thankfully and with courage in the power of your spirit. Would you please be seated? I'm going to use this one because I think it's working a bit better. You know what I'll be doing this week, don't you? Trying to get that fixed. Because next week is where it all begins. As I've said, Palm Sunday is just a week away. A couple of things coming up in this week to draw your attention to. On Wednesday morning, our choir are singing as part of this year's Musica Viva program. And they're part of the series on Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. at the concourse at Chatswood. A beautiful program of music that we often hear here at church, uh, which we're going to share with a wider audience. So come along and uh, encourage anyone in the audience to come to church. You, you can see the idea here. Um, also, I need to tell you that there's a brand new work as part of the concert, which has been commissioned by Music Aviva, and it's been composed by our former chorister, Owen Elsley. So it will receive its world premiere at Chatswood on Wednesday morning. There's an announcement about that in your pew sheet. Also, I take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the St. James Music Foundation for some early distributions in the year to assist particularly in the paying off of our new organ and noting especially their generosity in uh, an additional donation of $200,000 from the St. James Music Foundation funds to assist in the project. We've given you an update in today's pew sheet and uh, some information there to encourage you to think about continuing to support this most worthy project some of you will ask me, can we use the organ at Easter? In a word, well, two words, not really. Um, we might be allowed to use a little bit of it as we have done before, but really the work of voicing will take us till June and July, which is why we've decided to celebrate and dedicate our new organ at the time of our patronal festival, to give us time not only to get the organ voiced and tuned, but to give our organists the opportunity to get to grips with the new has that died? No, it's all right. It's one of those mornings. Um, so thanks to the Foundation and to all of you who have been so generous in your support of this project for the future, for the generations that come after us. Next Sunday morning, take a special note of the service times, 8 o'clock, and then at 10 a.m. we begin outside, just behind me in Queen Square, for the blessing of the palms, and then we'll have our procession and the Choral Eucharist is at 10 a.m. on Sunday. And then next Sunday at 2 o'clock, we'll be at the St. James Institute, and I'll be interviewing our Holy Week and Easter preacher, Bishop Andrew Proud, the former Bishop of Reading, one of the assistant bishops in the Diocese of Oxford. And I might just deviate for a moment and thank Warren for programming this morning's mass setting, which was, first of all, by one of my favorite composers, Herbert Howells. Thank you for that. But noting particularly that it was his setting written for Christ Church Oxford, his Missa Aedes Christi, the House of Christ, uh, which is, of course, where I worked for some time and where the formation that began here continued and where Bishop Andrew was a particular friend and mentor to me. So it's a very personal invitation uh, to have Andrew with us, and I'm really looking forward to journeying with you and with him through Holy Week and Easter this year. There's information about all of that in your pew sheet. Would you please stand?
draw you to himself, that you may find in him crucified a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sin forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.